they've created their own fabrication, their own plasma. Now, in the other arts and sciences, it is likewise a hypothesis as that which is posited, the presupposition, which facilitates both action and inquiry, and ultimately knowledge itself. Aristotle, in his metaphysics, says simply that hypothesis, uh, the starting point or the first principle of demonstration. For instance, he would to give an example. The goal of health is a hypothesis for the doctor. The doctor doesn't deliberate whether he's going to pursue health or not. It's a given. And then he works on that hypothesis to um, deliberate how to attain it. Mathematicians, likewise, he suggests, hypothesize certain axioms and then proceed from those axioms with their demonstrations. These hypotheses are tentative if you come to a conclusion which is manifestly false or if the goal is completely unattainable, you have to revise your hypothesis. So again, according to Irenaeus, the heretics, the Valentinian Gnostics, have based their exegesis upon their own hypothesis rather than that foretold by the prophets, taught by Christ, and traditioned by the apostles. They they start on their own hypothesis, their own starting point. Now, interestingly, at least since the time of Plato, the goal of philosophy has always been to try and discover the ultimate first principle, the non-hypothetical first principle. But even here... Aristotle concedes it's impossible to ask for a demonstration of your first principle. Now think about that for a moment. That's exactly the point that Irenaeus is going to pick up on. It's impossible to ask for a demonstration, a proof of your first principle. If it's your first principle, the hypothesis which you are positing as the ground for your rational thought. Well, if you could prove it, it'd have to be by reference to something else. And that then becomes your hypothesis, your first principle. So you either are led into an infinite regress in which you've got no starting point, or ultimately you have to accept that your starting point depends upon faith. There is no way of, other way of doing it. So the search for the first principle of demonstration ends up Clement of Alexandria points out, ends up with indemonstrable faith. If you could prove it, it has to be by reference to something else, and that then becomes your first principle. To give an example, in Christian theology, we do not say that Christ is true. Because if you could say that he's true, it would be by reference to something else by which you are judging him. Yeah? And so that actually would then be your God. Yes? No, you don't say Christ is true. You say he is the truth. Very important difference. Okay? So the um, Hellenistic philosophers, they all knew that your first principle cannot be proved. Whatever area of knowledge you are talking about, it cannot be proved, but it depends upon faith. Unless you accept a starting point, you've got no ground for working out anything else. Okay? And this starting point also works as a canon. Okay? Now, when we use the word canon, we tend to think of the list of the books of Scripture. Well, the word canon was not used that way until 1768, I think it was. In antiquity, the word canon simply means a straight line. It's a guide, it's a rule by which you determine whether something is straight. Aristotle says, by that which is straight, we discern both the straight and the crooked. For the canon is a test of both, but the crooked tests neither itself nor the straight. Only if you've got a line which is straight can you determine another straight line or a crooked line. So, you need a canon. Without a canon, without a criterion, Knowledge is not possible. 
all inquiry will be led into endless regression. You will never know when you've, when you've hit the mark. So your first principle acts as a canon. And so every account of philosophy from the Hellenistic period, um, 1st century BC to 2nd, 3rd century AD, starts off by giving an account of the criterion, of the canon by which it will then work. Unlike the Gnostics who are mythologizing something new every day. Now, the important point here is put it well by Eric Osborne, who said, the rule, the canon, did not limit reason to make room for faith, but used faith to make room for reason. Without a credible first principle, reason was lost in an infinite regress. Really important point would be upheld by any Hellenistic philosopher, going back to Aristotle, Yet it's the opposite of what we tend to think today. We tend to think that the rule of truth, the rule which you believe, the creed, marks out a space where reason doesn't have to work. Yeah? Because it's faith and you can't prove it, you can't talk about it, and you know, what do you really do with it anyway? Yeah? No, the point is actually the other way around. Unless you've got a canon, a criterion, which is acting as your starting point, your first principle, your hypothesis... You can't think. You know, unless you've got a line to determine whether something is straight or not, you're never going to be able to determine whether something is straight or not. Yeah? And as a hypothesis, as a first principle, you can't prove it, whatever field of knowledge it might be. You have to accept it on faith. Yeah? So that's what Irenaeus, in his articulation of orthodox theology, is talking about when he appeals to a canon of truth. It's not to assert a hierarchical, patriarchal power against any free-thinking Gnostic is to make thought possible. Okay? When he is talking about tradition, it's not just simply that which we lay claim to and the Gnostics are claiming some other kind of tradition. It's specifically the tradition of understanding Christ according to the scriptures as goes back to Paul himself. I delivered to you what I received. Christ died in accordance with scripture. Okay? So the, that, that's the fabric of orthodoxy. And what it does is to enable this understanding of the church as a community of interpretation, a conversation of interpretation, with different voices in it which are able to hear one another and blend together in one symphony rather than just being a disjarring single note like Martian who didn't want anybody else to be heard apart from himself and so founded a, a church of people who thought like himself. Okay. Okay. There's one other area I want to talk about, <coughs> if you're with me so far. Quite a few questions, but it's also 25 past 8, and then when I start talking, I tend not to stop. <laughs> okay. The second point of importance I want to talk about is that it's the crucified and risen Christ who is therefore the subject. Okay, the, or the, the, the subject of our reflection. It's not what happened before the cross. Those who were with him before the cross didn't get anything from that. They went and abandoned him, you know, whatever they heard. They understood it differently after the cross when the scriptures were open and so on. Okay? It's a crucified and risen Christ that is uh, the subject in all of this. Okay? Now, as the early earliest Christians searched the scriptures to understand how God was at work in this Christ, one of the most important texts they came across, of course, was Isaiah 53, the hymn of the suffering servant. By appealing, by going back to Isaiah 53, they could see that Christ was not simply put to death, but voluntarily went to his death. Okay? And by voluntarily going to his death, trampled down death by death, which we'll be seeing in a few weeks' time. Now, this is perhaps the hardest thing for us to hear altogether. That's why I have to sing it so often. Okay? And that's why we never listen to it. Okay, because what it means is that Christ shows us what it is to be God in the way that he dies as a human being. 
And when you actually think through that, that is stunning. It's not that he dies because he's human, but because he's God, he's able to get himself out of the grave, as we often think. That would be a really bad Christology. That'd be worse, worse than Nestorius. And more to the point, it wouldn't help anybody else. Okay? It would help him. He'd be able to get out, but nobody else would have to be benefited by that. Okay? Rather, it's by voluntarily going to his death as one over whom death has got no claim, for there was no sin in him, by voluntarily going to his death he shows himself to be stronger than death, such that it cannot hold him. He shows us what it is to be God in the way that he dies as a human being. Now for us, death is that which expresses all the weakness, all the frailty, all the ultimately, absurdity of our existence. We've come into existence through no choice in our own part. As Kirillov says in The Possessed, Dostoevsky, nobody asked me if I wanted to be born. Yeah, there's no choice in my existence. No freedom in my existence. It's a given. And I'm thrown into an existence in which whatever I do, I will die. Again, with no choice. Okay? It's really absurd on one level. It expresses all the weakness, the futility, the impotence of whatever we think we can make of ourselves. But moreover, in this way, death is the only thing which is common to all human beings from the beginning of the world onwards. And so it is here and nowhere else 